um, I just would like to remind everyone, this is being live streamed. So when you ask... President Trumpka, is <laughs> normally I assume that everybody's read Wikipedia and I don't really need to do an inter introduction for, uh, um, for our guests, but um, your story is not really told well on Wikipedia, so I'm gonna augment it a little bit. Anyway, I'm Tim Collins. I'm, uh, I'm here more often than I thought I would be. Um, doing this sort of thing and others, and uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to be here with uh, President Trumpka. So, what it does say on Wikipedia is that you were uh, the son of coal miners, that you worked in the mines uh, through Penn State and Villanova Law School, that you went to work uh, in the uh, in the mine workers, yep. that you led a very successful, I mean, in a business school, it's hard to know what a very successful strike means, but in the world, real people know what a very successful strike means, and it, you led a very successful strike against Pittston, I think. Correct. And that's, unfortunately, was a long time ago when that happened. There haven't been enough very successful strikes, in my, in my view, since. Um, you were also uh, really important in organizing labor uh, in support of uh, the boycott against apartheid. And I just say this, um, for all of you that are going to go out and be captains of industry and hedge fund managers and leaders in whatever field, understanding uh, the story of Rich Trumpka and the role uh, in American society of organized labor is about as important as accounting or finance or marketing or operations research because it's really at the heart of, in my view, where we are as a country in terms of, hi, I don't like that, thanks. Uh, where we are in a country uh, that needs needs a lot of help, where we have an enormous gap between uh, the, the middle class and the top 1% or the top one-tenth of 1% or whatever percent you're talking about. And I I'm personally feel this. I, 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 in 1973, I was 17 years old and got my start as a member of the UAW, which is a part of the Yep. part of the AFL, and I, I would not be here today for sure if there had not been a UAW and if I hadn't had the chance to go to work in a UAW facility, which allowed me to go on to university, taught me a lot of great life lessons that have been very important in my business mm -hmm. career. So I'm gonna say uh, two more brief things, and then I'm gonna read the list, which I think is important, of all the, uh, of all the unions that you're in charge of. Um, number one, I'm going to just say, uh, as a working hypothesis, we will never have a, an equitable distribution of the, uh, the, the, the value created in our economy without collective bargaining and organized labor. It just will not happen. We will not have a stable... Uh, uh, econ progressive, uh, growing economy without organized labor. Um, and we will not have a society without deep divisions and without uh, the potential for chaos and bad results. I'm going to leave uh, specifying what our most proximate bad result uh, was to your imagination. So. Figuring out how to, how to uh, bring organized labor uh, to the forefront in our economic and political process, in my view, is, is sort of one of the existential um, challenges of, uh, of, the next, uh, of the next period of political and economic change. So I'm gonna just tell one uh, inappropriate story, and then I'm gonna read the, uh, 
read the 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 all stars uh, that you're I mean, shocking. How, uh, so there, you, you have twelve and a half million members, more or less. My um, eighteen year old son, who is in his last year at fancy English boarding school. Um, had the privilege of working at the AFL last summer, and he called me breathless. And he said, Dad, this guy's amazing. And I said, he said, he's taken me, he just took me to a meeting with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. And he said, I said, well, that's really cool, Luke. That's, that's really cool. He said, Dad, first thing he did when he got in the car, he pulled out a pouch of chewing tobacco and started spitting in a cup. So he was more, more, more excited about meeting a real person that represented real uh, habits of, uh, not, habits is a bad word, but a real uh, unabashed uh, representative of the American uh, middle of the country and real people who we don't get in touch with enough. So I'm not going to read them all, but I'm going to read you a list of uh, the disparate group of, of unions that the AFL represents. Actors Equity Association, Airline Pilots Association, American Federation of School Administrators, American Train Dispatchers, Bakery, I'm not a big fan of the bakery uh, and confectioners, uh, uh, tobacco workers, Brotherhood of Railroad Signalmen, California School Employees Association, International Association of Firefighters, International Association of Sheet Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Workers, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, uh, I'm a big fan of them, uh, uh, International Union of Elevator Constructors, Professional Aviation Safety Specialists, the the Office of Professional Employees International Union. Uh, Unite Here, Unite, which I think is a great model, uh, a, a very successful or a increasingly successful uh, factor in politics uh, in the United Kingdom and it's great. Uh, in the United Mine Workers, of course, and the United Auto Workers, to which I'm eternally grateful. So we're incredibly happy to have you here today. I think it's, uh, I've, you know, I've interviewed a dozen CEOs over the last few years, and I have to say, in terms of what you uh, have to offer as an additional perspective, this is the most important uh, opportunity I've had to help uh, the wonderful students at the school management uh, prepare themselves for their future. So. With that, I'm going to ask uh, President Trump a few questions, and then everybody's uh, will have a uh, uh, will have an open session um, that you can ask whatever you like. Um, and what I would say is just do. You know, we, we mentioned the microphone. Um, also, just say who you are, a little bit about your background when you ask questions. So, um, tell me more than the Wikipedia version. How did you get to be the president of this huge organization? Well, uh, and what was important along the way? I uh, came out of high school. I was a fairly good athlete. I was looking to play college football uh, at one of the big schools. I had a scholarship there. And I got my knee busted uh, in one of the, the games. And so I lost the scholarship. and. As a result, I went in the mine, in the coal mine, and at the time I thought it was uh, the most unfair thing that could ever happen to anybody. Uh, a great all-American football player was being denied the opportunity to play football. I immediately got involved uh, in, in, uh, in the union, became a chairman of the safety committee, and we, we had a, uh, an autocratic president at that time. His name was Tony Boyle. Uh, and we decided there was a group called the Miners for Democracy that wanted to democratize the mine workers. I joined that, became involved in it, uh, got elected on the Miners for Democracy slate. Uh, and then the, the union, uh, during that period of time, sent me to law school. I went to Villanova Law School, came back, uh, went to work for the union, and the guy that we got elected who beat Tony Boyle, by the way, Tony Boyle arranged for the murder uh, of Jock Yablonski, his wife, and his daughter on the New Year's Eve. Not a very Democratic guy. No. It was after the election, too. It was uh, New Year's Eve in 1969. Uh, and so we elected a guy, and he became uh, 
less than effective, and I had a couple of policy fights with him. I went back to the mine, I ran for office, got elected to the executive board, and then ran against him uh, in 1982 and got elected international president of the mine workers. Got elected two more times as president, and uh, we had a, a president at the AFL-CIO at that time, his name was Lane Kirkland, great guy, but he, he was focused solely on eliminating the Cold War. I mean, every, every person he could go after, he could, and he was doing a great job of that. Unfortunately, we were getting clobbered back home, and we needed him to help us back home. We went to him two or three times and said, this is great work you're doing, but you gotta help us back here. He didn't do that, so we decided to run against him. We had a group of about 10 unions uh, that said we're going to run against him, and we, we nominated John Sweeney. Not nominated him, sort of drafted him. And then they drafted me to be Secretary Treasurer. I said, I don't want to be Secretary Treasurer. I mean, I'm happy being president of my workers. I don't want to, I don't want to go anywhere. And I called my dad, who spent 44 years in, in the mine, and my dad was pretty matter-of-fact. Things were pretty black, white. They were bad, you fought against them. If they were good, you fought for them. So he listens to me moan a little while about uh, them wanting me to run. And he said, look, he said, you started this thing. You got to finish it. So either put up or shut up. So I decided to run. We got elected uh, a couple of times. And then John retired, and I became president in 2009. But along the way, what were some of the seminal moments, the developmental, uh, you know, the struggles that you had that made you such an effective leader that allowed you to go from the mine to the run of the biggest union organization in the United States? I, I, I think probably some of the, the things that molded me the most first was my fights in the, the civil rights movement. I was part of that. Uh, I actually led the labor movement when it came to anti-apartheid. Uh, we had a number of leaders who were wanted to back off on it, and I was going full speed ahead. And, and Tim, I'll I tell you one moment that I think really changed me. Uh, we, we had a rally in, in Alabama, uh, and uh, they were we were on strike at that time with, with Pittston as well. And we had an anti-apartheid rally there. And, after the rally, we were going back to this church, and there was a, it was a black church, and it had a little fence. And two of my members, white guys from Alabama, were in front of me, and they didn't know I was behind them. And they walked up to that fence, and they, they stared. They stopped and stared at that fence. They knew the symbolism of crossing that fence, and it was something they hadn't done before. And I walked up behind them, and I said to them in, in one's ear, I said, these people are good enough to fight for us. You're not good enough to pray with them. They opened the gate and they walked in. But it told me uh, really some of the challenges that I had in, in the labor movement. That just because we try to be sterile when it comes to race, we still have prejudice out there that we have to fight. And we have to be at the tip of that spear, not the middle of it, but at the tip of that spear. And that's what we've been trying to do. After Ferguson, I went out and met with community people out there uh, and, and found out what we needed to do and how we needed to change and what we needed to bring to the table, uh, not just us coming in with a half-baked solution and saying, here's what you need to do. Uh, so that was one big time. The, the Pittston strike, uh, when they were trying to take health care away from about 300,000 widows and uh, orphans. And uh, I, uh, we went on strike to stop that from happening. And there was a pivotal moment uh, when I, we were getting injunctions. I mean, they enjoined us for everything. I, I mean, you couldn't sneeze, you couldn't look happy. They had an injunction against you. And finally, I called my executive board together and all my district presidents and I said, we have a stack of injunctions literally that high. And I said, I'm not going to listen to them. I'm going to do what I have to do to win this strike and save these people's health care. And I got to tell you, it was the most liberating day of my life. Uh, they fined us uh, 
into the trillions of dollars. They, they find us 500,000 500, a day, and the amount doubled every day. So it moved up pretty quickly. After the strike was over, the Supreme Court decided that they had done it improperly and removed the fines, but uh, in a 9 to 0 decision, by the way. That was a transitional moment for me. So tell me, uh, this was on my list of questions I was going to ask you, but you know, back then, uh, back then and the 20 years before, the labor movement made a huge difference in the lives of uh, working class people. Yeah. What's the situation today? What's what's wrong with the with the uh, situation for working class people today? Well, maybe I just frame where we came from. You know, if you look at it, it was the labor movement that actually built the American middle class after after World War II uh, through collective bargaining. Uh, we took bad jobs and made them into good jobs. We took a mining job that was a horrible job, made it into a, a good family middle class producing job. Um, and, and then when we did that, productivity soared and wages soared. They were tied together. Productivity and wages were tied together. In, in the mid 70s, uh, a guy by the name of Paul Volcker decided he was going to change the rules. And so he was going to fight wages no matter what he did. And he changed uh, the Federal Reserve, as you well know, has two jobs. Fights inflation, but it has to fight for full employment. Volcker said, I'll no longer concern myself with full employment. I will fight, inf I will fight inflation, which meant fighting wage increases, in his opinion, even though it had proven wrong because they were tied to productivity. So then you had uh, Ronald Reagan come along, and Ronald Reagan busts uh, a union, PATCO, uh, and says to the world, <laughs> it's okay to bust unions. Before that, it was taboo. Nobody would bust the union because it was not a good thing to do. It was bad uh, because unions had produced the middle class. Unions were helping with health and safety. Unions were creating legislation, pushing legislation to increase the minimum wage, protected pensions, brought health care to people, all of those different <clears throat> things. Uh, and he busts the union, and it was free reign after that uh, for them to, to come after unions. And then there's another milestone. Uh, when when the, the wall fell in Europe uh, and, and the Cold War sort of ended, uh, that was a seminal moment when business decided it was okay again to go full tilt boogie to eliminate unions. Because prior to that, you had two systems that were competing. You had a communist system, you had a capitalist system, and everybody's saying, this is good, this is better. And, and they didn't want to look bad and drive people to this system. But when this, when the communists fell, then it was free game and they came after us. Now, that's the bad news. They're still after us. 26 states right now are going after bad legislation that would eliminate collective bargaining, would prohibit collective bargaining, would minimize collective bargaining. But here's the good news. Year before last, we organized 251,000 new members. Last year, we organized 262,000 <laughs> new members. Of those people, 75% of those members were under the age of 35. And just last week, we organized 15,000 new members last week because people are angry. The system isn't working for them, and they're looking for a way to change the system and change the rules of the system. Uh, they elected Donald Trump because they thought he would change the rules. He has, not the way they had anticipated. Uh, and so they're looking for that rule change, and they're coming to us. Collectivism in the United States is alive, well, and on the rise. And I got to tell you, I ain't been this excited for a good while because you got the women's movement coming together. You got Black Lives Matter. You got young people coming together. You got everybody out there and teachers spontaneously saying, we're going to change a system that robs us of resources for this school so we can't even give every kid a textbook. And you pay us these paltry wages that we can't live on. Collectivism is alive and well, and I tell you, Tim, I ain't felt this good in a long time because I see young people on the rise saying we're stronger when we come together. 
We can do more <coughs> when we unite, and we can do things together that we can't do alone. It's counterintuitive, but it seems like these strikes are really good for the movement. That you know, that go out and flex muscle and show that it has results. And that's uh, I know there's actually academic work. Uh, I think yeah. you've seen it that says the healthy uh, healthy uh, labor movement needs an occasional strike to stay. Uh, to stay excited and engaged. And you gotta have people on the move. Yeah. They, they gotta have some wins. So another question that's not on my uh, approved list, but uh, talk about NAFTA, trade, and Donald Trump. Okay, uh, first let me go back and talk about NAFTA, trade, and, and Bill Clinton. Because remember, NAFTA was signed uh, under Clinton with a, a Democratic president, a handful of uh, Democrats and a barrel full of Republicans. Uh, it was a, a, a bill that, a trade agreement that was really good for Wall Street, but bad for workers on all three sides of the border. Mexican workers saw their standard of living reduced. American workers saw their standard of living reduced. Canadian workers saw their standard of living not reduced, but slowed significantly. So you, you have this pretty universal acceptance that it was a bad agreement. Even Bill Clinton has said publicly and privately to me that, yeah, it was a bad I've agreement. seen the public part. Yeah, well, he, he said it uh, a couple of times. And, and so, and, if his yeah, wife had said it, she'd be the president. If his wife had said it and they believed, and workers believed her, she would have been the I, president. I stand corrected. That was, that was the problem. Uh, and so Trump, Trump says, I'm going to get rid of all these trade agreements. They're the worst trade agreements in the world. And workers perked up. I mean, they perked up. They said, will he do it? Now, let me tell you, I've, I've actually been working with him. We've been working with him on trade, with, with Lighthouser and a guy by the name of Peter Navarro. That's his two trade people. Uh, and I'm to the point where I'm saying it is possible that in the next three or four weeks, uh, a trade agreement could be announced that is actually good and that we would support it. Because he, here's the, the age-old tactic that I get sick about. They, they come up with a trade bill that is actually a, a, a finance bill. It's not really a trade bill. It's bad for everybody but the finance people. And then they say, if you're not for that, you're this Neanderthal protectionist. But there's all this room between free, open free trade and protectionists and what we want is something here that is good for trade, good for the economy, and good for workers on both sides of the border. Because if we don't raise wages for the Mexican worker, we'll never be able to get a situation where trade works. We won't, because they can't buy our product. And they'll be sucked, jobs will be sucked out because of the lower wages, the lure of lower wages. So it's possible that he'll come up with something. Uh, and, and I can tell you this, I've had much more contact with Lighthouser and Navarro than I did with Froman, uh, Froman Obama's person. He was uh, a very, very arrogant man that wouldn't even talk, wouldn't even consider workers' point of view. Uh, I have no comment on that. Um, I'm gonna go back to the script. You're, you're about to, uh, to unveil a study in some work that you've done on the future of work. And we've had uh, in this room over the past few months a variety of CEO perspectives on the future of work. What's the future of work? And, it will, and, and how's it gonna work out for average American working class people? Well, that all depends. Uh, here's two questions that I ask, and I'll, I'll start my answer by asking two questions. Question number one, what happens to a system that is incapable or unwilling to provide a rising standard of living for its population? What happens to that system? I can tell you what history says. History says that system gets changed one way or another. Second question, you have technology. Technology isn't good or it isn't bad. It isn't evil, it isn't good. It's neutral. It's how it's 
displayed, how it's employed, and who gets the benefits of technology. So the question becomes, who is going to get the benefit of technology? Will it be the investor class, or will it be the, the community, the workers, and everybody else? You see, Tim, we have a thing in the labor movement, we, I would call it bargained acquiescence. <coughs> when they brought new technology in, we bargained for how that technology affected people's lives. We tried to make it work for us. So that if it increased productivity, we should get a higher wage and more time off and, and make it work. Uh, we don't have that in society. There's no way for society to bargain about how we're gonna divide the benefits of that increased productivity. So the answer to your question is, if that increased productivity is used to raise wages and reduce hours and let us spend more time with our family, it's a win-win. If it is used and it goes to the top one-tenth or one percent, inequality will continue to grow, anger, frustration will continue to grow, and the system will implode, and it will get changed one way or the other. So. What I see is uh, the beginnings of that. Uh, of, of which of the two scenarios? Uh, of people demanding change and the, pa the glide path towards real change if the rules aren't changed. You're seeing the beginning of that. You're seeing it in the teacher strikes. You're seeing it in Black Lives Matter. You're seeing it in uh, young people going after violence and gun control. Uh, you're seeing it uh, w with the women's movement, enough is enough. Uh, and so all of that's coming together because they're angry about what's happening and no one's out there talking. So what we have to do, uh, we have to start the debate on how the benefits of AI and, and all of the other technologies and robots and all of those things, how the benefits of that get divided. Because if we don't do it, it's not gonna get done. It'll be by default, and I can tell you what'll happen. You'll see the, the investor class will get more and more and more, and the rest of the people will get less and less and less. More people will get left behind. Well, more people will not have the skills necessary to progress, and you'll see the anger and the frustration rise to the point where the system will ultimately uh, implode on it. And just let me say this. Uh, it has a direct impact on democracy. Uh, a recent study, they asked millennials how important is it to live in democracy? And 30% of millennials said it's important to live in a democracy. 70% of millennials said it's not important. And 24% of those millennials said it's bad to live in a democracy. See, they've been the victims of a broken economy. And that's, it's having an effect on democracy as well. Because the democracy that they know has given them an economy that is uh, unequal and in many times blatantly unfair. So what's, what are the recommendations in this new... Uh... Well, we're not done yet. We just started it. Well, what we're doing is we, we looked at ourselves and we said we need to take a good look at where our work's going. So uh, our, our commission on the future is what it is. It, it'll be in four parts. The first part will be where the economy is and where it's going. Uh, and we're we're working with uh, people on both sides of the spectrum, people we agree with, people we don't agree with. The second part will be where work is and where work's going. We're working with Carnegie Mellon and MIT who are at the, the lead of uh, technology uh, and, and uh, artificial intelligence uh, and robotics. Uh, and then the third phase will be what our unions are and what they need to be given what the economy will be and what work will be, and then the fourth phase will be what the AFL-CIO needs to be given what our, that's terrific. what they need and what the economy and work. I think so that's really valuable. We, we, we'll bring it together. We kick it off May 3rd. Uh, we're going to have a, a tremendous number uh, of experts that we work with, uh, and I only gave them one, one charge. I want it to be intellectually honest. I want you to go talk through this thing, it does us no good to put our heads in the sand and pretend that we know what's gonna happen over here when that's not true. So it's a, a chance for us to get in front of the curve 
and then start helping workers shape what the economy and what all of the technology and AI will do. Because we're the only group, the union movement is the only group that's gonna stand up for workers. I, I, I hear, hear. I, I, I'm, not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna agree with your Paul Volcker uh, antecedents of the situation we're in now, but, but most of the rest of it, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think Volcker, Anyway, we'll, we'll discuss Volcker at another time. He's a friend of mine, by the way. He's a, he's a good friend of mine, too. So that notwithstanding, we are and have been for some time in a world where the general uh, perspective among business leaders is save me from a union. Whatever I can do, let me go to wherever I need to go to avoid having to deal with a union. And that, that's not com always true, but it's mostly true. I, I have always had a view that in many, many cases, you get the union you deserve. I mean, it's management that creates the environment where it becomes deeply adversarial. But many of the, uh, of the students here are gonna be managers yeah. and are gonna be business leaders. Yeah. So from your perspective, what's your advice to them? Well, uh, what's a good manager? Well, I'd, quite frankly, I'd take your picture and hold it up because you have been different. <laughs> uh, you've been uh, a manager that's understood uh, that- That's not always worked out. You know, <laughs> that's well, the right way, but- Workers, right. workers are uh, an asset to be invested in, yeah. not a cost to be cut. Uh, so what's a good manager? First, you, you start off with, it, it, first of all, it's tough. It's a tough thing, uh, and, but I, I have no doubts that all of you are, are up for it. You're gonna to have to make a decision as a manager uh, what kind of manager you're gonna be. Are you gonna reach out to your employees and bring them in? Or are you gonna make a fist and wanna punch those employees? You got to decide whether employees are partners or they're adversaries. Uh, whether their unions are welcome or not welcome in, in, your, in your workplace. Uh, a good manager starts with the basic foundation of honesty and integrity. Uh, and that's going to be a tougher and tougher thing for managers in, in your working careers for you to hold up to because the system is so rigged uh, and, and it's so skewed and it's so politicized right now that having your own integrity and honesty uh, is different. The, 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 the second thing I'd say... Uh, a manager needs to do is be a listener first. To listen to things, uh, what's going on, uh, and, and try to evaluate uh, that what you've, what you've just heard rather than talking first. Because when a manager talks, subordinates stop parroting anything. They're, you're gonna hear mostly back uh, what you just said. So if you really wanna understand what people are thinking, let them talk first. You listen, and then you can respond. Because I know with my staff, if I come in and pound the table and say, I want to do this, everybody goes, right on. Uh, if I don't pound the table, I say, what do you think we ought to do? I get differing opinions, uh, which is what we should be doing. Uh, I think you got to be innovative. I think you got to look forward. I think you got to be a risk taker. You gotta be willing to take some risks. Uh, not reckless, but you have to be willing to take risks. You gotta be willing to fail. You gotta be willing to step up and say, I'm gonna try, and if it doesn't work, I'm gonna call it. And then you gotta be willing to call it a failure. Right. Uh, and not stay with it forever just because it was your idea. Uh, all of those things, I think, make a, a good manager. Uh, but I think uh, deciding right off what you're gonna be, whether your employees are partners or adversaries is your first decision you're gonna make. And I urge you to do the, the former, uh, not the latter, because they, they really are your partners. And when, when we work together, when management and labor truly works together, there's nobody out there that can beat us. I'm gonna just make one editorial comment and then we're gonna ask, uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions, but I, I, would, I would say that actually, just physically, and it's it's more it's it's more obvious in other countries where this 
where the adversary management's not such a you know knee-jerk adversary. But if you want to make your uh, employees partners, it's easier if they're organized. Yes, it's it is. easier. It just then you have a counterparty. Yeah. You have. Uh, a filter, you have a communications uh, uh, method, and it's an easier thing to do. And it's not, that's not the conventional wisdom, but you know, I've invested all around the world, and I can tell you, uh, hasn't always worked out in, in the United States, but it is, when it does, it's great. And uh, in other parts of the world, it, you know, the habits you know, that have grown up in the last 25, 30 years aren't as obvious in Sweden or Japan no, or they they've, they've been, you know, more in the partnership mode for a long, or Germany or France. Well, France may be different today, but oh, it's uh, the same. But, but when they come here, they revert back to the, the lower edge. Sometimes system they're here. told to do that or else yeah, they won't get uh, the, here, the here's, subsidies. Here's the way I make that decision uh, to make your original point. Uh, I use my wife and my, my son. My son was five years old at the time. He comes into me, my office at home. He goes, Dad, uh, I would like to have a motorcycle. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, no. And I went back to working. So my kid walks out, disappointed. The answer is no. Then my wife comes in. My wife said, I want to buy a new car. I said, well, let's sit down and talk about it. Uh, my wife and I are about equally bargaining power. Well, I'd like to think I am, but she really, she really has more bargaining power than I do, probably. But my son has no bargaining power. That's what happens at a workplace. When the workers come together, they have equal bargaining power with the employer, and you, you make better decisions for everybody. When you're alone, you're like my son, you got no bargaining power. The employer says no, you're gone. The employer's capricious, you're gone. It doesn't matter. And so when we come together and you have a union where all the workers can have a structure to come together, then labor management cooperative programs just soar. Uh, and we have several, you know, we have a number of examples where the big ones, little ones, Harley Davidson uh, made a comeback from where they were on the brink of uh, extinction and, and came back with a, a partnership. Uh, healthcare industry, a uh, number of them, different places where it happens. And then you Building have the grades. other extreme, you know, where, uh, where you have employers that say they're, they're, they're an adversary. Now think about this. It's tough for a union to be cooperative when they know that if they turned their back, the employer would stick a shiv in them. That they want to eliminate your existence. You might want to explain shiv. Not everybody's been in prison. Oh. Well, it's a, it's a, a handmade knife uh, that is capable of killing you. Uh, I got it right away. Yeah, it's not a pleasant experience, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, if in fact you're always trying to guard your existence, it's tougher to say, hey, let's cooperate. Absolutely. But, but it's our system. The system here breeds uh, adversarialism. And let me ask you this. Think about this. Think about if you were you went out on a date with someone, uh, and, and the first thing on the date was the other person started telling you how ugly you are, how unattractive you are, how dumb you are, how bad you are, how they never would like like to see you around. You shouldn't exist. You have no useful purpose. You think there'd be a second date? I mean, probably not. But that's what we do here. A union comes in, and workers decide they want to they have a voice. Not some third party. It's the workers decide they want to have a voice. And the employer says, you're no good rotten, and they fight you. And they hire lawyers that spend billions, billions, billions of dollars to stop those workers from having a voice. And then we win the election. Hey, let's have a second date. You know, sometimes they do it. But we're a little skeptical. Yeah, you know, we sort of keep an extra eye on them to make sure that they're really going to live up to their let's really be partners. And when it happens, it happens exceptionally well, and it becomes strong. Uh, and when it doesn't, we fight. And when we fight, everybody loses. Workers lose, employer loses, community loses, everybody loses. I mean, it's a, it's a colossal waste uh, of talent, energy, and resources that get spent 
on fighting over whether we should exist and whether workers should have a voice or they shouldn't have a voice. Because if they have a voice, collective bargaining brings about fairer results. We get better wages, we get better benefits, we get more safety on a job, we get ability to perform uh, in democracy because we get uh, some, most places, a lot of our places get election day off so you can actually vote and participate. You get all of that and the employer gets skilled workforce, someone who's committed to their success uh, and, and training and has the ability, the monetary ability to buy their product. Because if you don't have wages, you can't spend. If you can't spend, you can't create demand. If you don't create demand, what happens? Spiral downward, not spiral upward. So our job uh, is to make the employer see that uh, having a partnership is important. It is successful and it will make them more productive. Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that's right. It just sounds like a hard job. But I'm taking, I asked too many questions. Who's first? Hi, uh, I used to work in the International Labor Organization before coming to the School of Management, uh, strengthening trade unions in Peru and Colombia. And when they had problems with the employers, they would heavily rely on the International Labor Organization conventions, such as the Convention 87 or 98 on collective bargaining and uh, trade union association. Uh, well, the point is, you say that collective bargaining here and unionization is it's increasing and it's strengthening, but the U.S. has not ratified both conventions, and you yeah. only have two of the eight uh, fundamental right conventions. So I'm wondering, how do you deal with such a complex uh, relationship without uh, such um, group of norms and, and frameworks to, to rely on? Well, the U.S.'s hypocrisy gets thrown in our face a lot. Um, I, I'm the president of a thing called TUAC, the Trade Union Advisory Council to the OECD. So we represent the OECD countries. I represent the working people in the OECD countries, as well as being president of the AFL-CIO. And when we talk to them, there are actually 108 uh, uh, rat uh, rules out there, and we've adopted five, uh, four of which were maritime, and one was slavery, child slavery. We did adopt that, but we've adopted none of the the ratifications or, or the rules that say uh, you can have freedom of association, freedom of collective bargaining. Uh, and so they, they throw it in our face constantly. E even petty tyrants throw that in our face constantly because they adopt them and then don't live by them. Uh, and, and the ILO, unfortunately, doesn't have the teeth to be able to make them live by it. They issue reports and we shame them publicly and after eight or 10 years they say, well, okay, we'll, we'll do something. And sometimes they do. So uh, I, I just try to stay on the facts and look at what collective bargaining does. Look at what it does, uh, it gives a voice to workers. It's a counter uh, balance uh, to corporate America. It's a counterbalance in democracy uh, to the takeover that we've seen since the Citizens United decision. In the last election cycle, two brothers, they're called the Koch brothers, spent $996 million in one election cycle. That's four million short of a billion. I mean, if I were them, I would have spent the other four million and made it a billion. I, I would try to get adopted it, by one of them. It, it's easier to say a billion than 996 million. Anyways, you're seeing more and more of that. And so we're the counterbalance to that. We, we collectively bring fives and ten dollars together uh, for workers and give them a, a louder voice so that we elect them and using the facts, being honest about it, and being consistent about it, you generally get people to look at it. Some, some of the people that were out there that would violate the ILO standards, uh, resolutions, were, they're never gonna change. Uh, I wish we would adopt them so that we had more credibility when we talk about it. We're, right now, you talked about the Mexican trade bill. The uh, Mexican, there's an election going on, uh, and it's gonna be, uh, It'll decide whether Mexico is sort of center or, or, or left or it's going to be 
far right uh, or possibly far left uh, in that election will decide it. They put up a bill uh, that says that they can continue a thing called protectionist contracts. A protectionist contract is this. You walk into my building, you say, I want to work for you, and you say, ah, you can work for me, but you have to sign this paper that says you'll never join a union, you'll never ask for a wage increase, you'll never ask for a benefit increase. You'll, you'll get what I give you and only what I give you. And they signed them. And we've been able to challenge them with DILO a lot of times and elsewhere. And they want to make that legal. So we started screaming about that through the ILO, through the OECD, through the ITUC, which is uh, the AFL-CIO of the world. Uh, we have a, an organization that has about uh, 175 million workers around the world. It's called the ITUC, uh, and it's a, sort of above us. We, we got them to drop the bill, not eliminate it, drop it. So after the election, that bill will pop back up, and it will prevent Mexico from changing its model. Their model is a low-wage model. They will keep wages low so they can suck investment in, into Mexico. As long as they can't, they have a low wage model, they can't buy our products, it can't standardize, we can't raise the level of the world up, we keep it down. And the ILO, a guy, guy is a, a friend of mine. I worked with him, he was at the ITUC before he went to the ILO and he's trying his best to weave through uh, what I would call a tangled morass of hypocrisy. Uh, and it's a tough job. I mean, you work there, you know what you get. Uh, first of all, it's slow. Second of all, it's slower. Third of all, it's slower with more BS than you can shake a stick at, even if you shake a pretty mean stick, uh, because they just lie to you about stuff. And then you have to send a commission in, and you have to find out the facts, and you come back and you say you lied. And they go, oh, we were mistaken. And so you, you start the process. And I, I really take my hat off to you for working for the ILO, because it's, it's an important world organization uh, that does twang the conscience uh, of people, and it prevents them from eliminating collective bargaining without the rest of the world knowing about it, scorning them, and talking it down. So thanks for what you did there. So I'm, I'm Devin, a first year MBA here. Before coming to SOM, I worked for a food company and had a chance to work with the, uh, a great union, UFCW 293 in Fremont, Nebraska. We've seen in production in the history of the United States many instances where there's been a technology which has come in and has upset the status quo, and there's been talks about how it could lead to mass disruption in the labor industry, and it hasn't, electrification, for example. What in your mind do you think is different about the challenges we're facing with artificial intelligence? About, about what? What is it that's different now with the challenges related to artificial intelligence and automation that we're seeing that's not what we've seen in the past. Why, why are you Why is it worse, now? more corrosive than historical changes in uh, technology? Because of the speed uh, and, the, and the magnitude of it. But before we saw changes, uh, little changes in the industry, it was sort of like an evolution. Now you're seeing a complete turnover uh, and a disruption. Uh, we had a mechanism to deal with most of those changes uh, in the past because as they brought machinery into the mines, we negotiated for that. Workers had a chance to negotiate that. With AI and technology and the massive stuff that's coming in right now, we don't have a mechanism to deal with that, to say how, in fact, are you going to divide the benefits of this? You have 12% of the workers in the country, 12.5% have a union right now. The rest of the workers in this country don't have a union. They have no voice. We have a society that's about to face a massive influx and change from artificial intelligence, technology, robotics, and all of those things, and nobody is saying, how do we make sure that the way it's deployed is fair? And if we don't do that, I can tell you the system will, it will implode. And it's virtually there now. So I guess it's the speed and the breadth uh, that the change is coming that, that alarms everybody. And the, the relative weakness of, uh, of organized labor of versus where it was in earlier periods. Right. 
Who's, uh, I don't, you have a name tag. What's the protocol about name tags? I, I'm just curious. Is it? Uh, uh, Yeah. Well, if you talked about the, to the experts, they say that the gig economy is going to be a, a small sliver. Uh, it's not going to be as big as uh, everybody or as revolutionary as it's out there. But, you know, uh, about well, six years ago now, seven years ago, we, we took a look, we being the AFLCO, took a look and said, how are we addressing the, the gig economy? And let me tell you what we did. We'd say, here's what we have, come and join us. And workers would say, that's really nice, but that doesn't work for me. And we said, yeah, yeah, we know, but come and join us anyway. And they said, yeah, that's nice, but it doesn't work for me. About seven years ago, we changed that whole thing. We went to them and said, what do you need? What do we have to be to help you? And when you have five or six employers, you're not going to get any benefits from every one of them. You know, the ones that want to truly be freelancers, they can do that. They can still have a voice, because we do have a union of freelancers uh, that talks and works for writers, works for other people that work for a lot of different employers. But we standardize their benefits in the industry, so no matter who they work with, they get a benefit. Uh, we, we can do that. Uh, we also, I think, were behind the curve uh, a, a good bit when it came to skills training uh, for, for the gig, gig economy, and we're now catching up to that. <coughs> our, our apprenticeship programs are helping people and saying, you need additional training, we'll help you train. Uh, and then we provide them with a, a package of benefits so that we tie them together and we speak for them uh, in, in the process. It's a constant evolution. And the, the thing that I've learned and we've learned is that don't ever take a picture and think you got it. Because if you take a picture, you, you got it now, but 20 minutes from now, you, it may be different. So always be instilling or you're looking at ways to change and evolve with them. The, the people in the gig economy, you know, they, they really do get misclassified a lot of times because a lot of them actually should be employer, full employees. They are. And we file a lot of Fair Labor Standards cases for them uh, and get them uh, back pay and get them benefits and get them uh, to become an employee. Uh, because you, you, the employers a lot of times want it both ways. They want to call them an independent contractor but treat them like an employee. If they're an independent contractor, they're an independent contractor. If they're an employee, they're an employee, and we work on that. So we've so, got time for okay. two more questions because I'm going to ask you one okay. hard question at the end. Hi, uh, my, my name's Emily Gordon. I'm on staff here. Um, thanks for coming. Um, you mentioned going to Ferguson and, and speaking with people there um, and that you ended up re-looking at some of the, you know, uh, what you needed to do for workers and listening and so forth. Uh, where, what role does labor have in um, dealing with um, discrimination in the workplace, whether it's uh, pay, you know, equity or um, discriminatory practices in hiring? Well, uh, let me tell you what we did uh, in Ferguson and then what spawned from Ferguson. Uh, I went out to Ferguson, I met with 30-some community groups, uh, and I actually thought that they wanted to talk about overt racism. And when I talked about overt racism, we just brushed it aside, and they said the racism we want to talk about is the denial of opportunity, a uh, much bigger issue. So it reoriented what I was doing. I created a commission. The commission actually went around the country uh, bringing white males I and people of color together. We had a conversation. We recommended uh, a lot of uh, changes within ourselves. Uh, and then we're now on phase two, 
where we'll continue to, to change those. Um, our, our job is to eliminate uh, the hiring. And in Ferguson, we went in and there were eight blocks where about 90% of the crime in Ferguson was happening. Uh, we struck a deal with them. We have a group called the Housing Investment Trust and the Building Investment Trust. And we're going to knock down those buildings, move those people, relocate them, build moderate and low income housing, bring the people back and put them there, take the people out of the community and put them in a remedial course because they couldn't pass our entrance exam for our apprenticeship. So we gave them a remedial course, increased their math skills, their English skills, their writing skills, got them into the apprentice program. They're working on the project. They'll stay involved and have a, a career forever uh, after the project is done. Uh, we're doing the same thing in Detroit. Uh, taking housing, rehabbing housing, bringing housing back in. We're developing a fund to bring in a minority uh, uh, entrepreneurs after the housing stuff is done. And then after that, uh, the thing that I'm most excited about is uh, we actually are talking with a, a, a one of the ma auto manufacturers right now to bring a, a factory back into Detroit proper uh, and train those people, get them back to work, have housing, have the uh, min minority uh, entrepreneurs in, in the neighborhood. And so our job is to bring it all together and create that opportunity and to prevent uh, discrimination, racism, sexism, any of the isms um, on the job. Uh, and, and that actually starts with us. I had an eighth grade teacher who said, anytime you point the finger at somebody, there's always three pointing back at you. And I've lived by that. I've tried to make us better. I've tried to make us better when it comes to racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, all of those things, so that we're better uh, at that, and we are actually leading the way. And we, we still have places where we fall down, and we have to get back up uh, and, and, you know, wipe the egg off of our face and continue down the path. But I can tell you, when it comes to uh, bullying, harassment, and, and sexual misconduct, I would call it, in the workplace, we adopted a program at the, every single instant, every meeting that we have, every event that we have, that is read. We have two people there that you can report to because I want people to know we're serious about changing the workplace uh, and there's no, nothing in the workplace. That no one, no one should have to go to work and put up with the nonsense that women have put up with, that people of color had to put up with, and in some, some instances what males have had to put up with. No one should have to do that. So we look at it as a workplace issue, and we're going to eliminate it from the workplace. That's great. I, one last. Um, you, you are. Oh. Uh -huh. um, and I'm, you mentioned earlier about um, how the labor movement has been successful in turning in the past and turning bad jobs into good jobs. I'm wondering how you're hearing that strategy for now, taking jobs from the service sector without um, stability, without career progression. How is that strategy carried forward? Well, it, it, it's what we're doing right now with, with every job that we're out there. Collective bargaining, when you bring people together, uh, and you say to them, here's how it works. So we, we go in and talk to workers and they say, we want a stronger, stronger voice. And we say, what are your issues? And they'll tell us what the issues are, what, what their issues are. So then we get collective bargaining, we can correct a lot of those issues that were there. And our, our goal is then, we, with, with our apprenticeship programs, we look to the future and we give our people the skills that are gonna be needed next year. Uh, electricians, you know, went from wiring to solar panels to other things, and we trained them on that. 
because we saw it coming. Best practices uh, in, in the industry. So our job uh, is to give you the skills necessary to compete in your industry or to be the best in your industry. Because in our, in our construction group, people say, your, your workers make more. Damn straight they do. They produce more too. They make a better building. They make it less time, they bring it in on time. Uh, and when you're done, you don't have to go back and call us in uh, to redo what somebody else did. It's done, on budget, on time. So our job, and I don't know if I'm completely answering your question, if, if there's more you, you, you wanna hear, why don't you hone it down for me? So I'm thinking more about like service sector jobs. Service sector jobs? Yeah, those low wage jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we take service sector jobs and negotiate them up as well. If you look at uh, some of the, the union jobs uh, in the service sector, you're going to see much better wages. Uh, you know, are they on a par uh, with uh, highly skilled people? Not yet, but we're negotiating them up. Uh, the the move for 15, the fight for 15, to bring $15 minimum wage to everybody in the service sector. That was fast food sector, not just the service sector, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's no difference between what collective bargaining does in the service sector, the manufacturing sector, the building trades, transportation, manufacturing, it all does the same. We bring you together, we find out what your needs and wants are, and then we negotiate for that. Sometimes it's just straight wages because they're so bad. Sometimes it's benefits. Sometimes it's skills training. Sometimes it's just an abusive atmosphere where you want it fixed. Sometimes it's a good job, but you want it to be better. And we bring people together to do that. I'm gonna save you for my last question because we're, we're over, but thank you. That was I'll give really, it. really. <laughs> thank you, man. Wow. That's a good picture too. Yeah, it's my high school picture. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it is cool.